What a difference seven days will make. If you remember what I looked like last week, how I sounded last week versus this week, there's a world of difference. I'm thankful for, uh, for healing and uh, for recovery, and uh, I'm glad to be here this morning. And I'm glad to have gotten to enjoy all of what our church service has to offer, even me as pastor, I'm, I'm thankful to get to enjoy what our service has to offer. Um, I was certainly missed out last week, and uh, I, I told Lisa that it just there was there was something missing from my day because I had not had the opportunity to be here and to see all of you and spend time with all of you, uh, and the the renewal of spirit that it does for me. Um, and I hope that you guys experience that same thing week after week, whenever you come to worship here. Um, Let's have a word of prayer before we begin. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this time together, Lord. I thank you for those that are here with us in person and for those that are watching uh, wherever in the world they may be at this time. I pray, Lord, a special blessing on each one. I ask, Lord, that you would be with me now as I speak, that the words that I say and the things that I do would be to your glory, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So, I wanted to continue off of last week's message a little bit. We had Mental Health Sabbath last week, and um, I I had some extra information to share from our uh, pastor's meetings that we went to last week that I wanted to to incorporate into a second part from what we had talked about last week. So this week, uh, the message is entitled Emotion, and uh, Nestor... Bruno, the gentleman that, um, that came and did our, our, uh, our talks for us while we were at pastor's meeting, he had a lot to say about emotions. And um, one, of the, one of the big things that he conveyed to us was that, that our emotions create movement. Okay, Our emotions get us going from one place to another. They carry us from one place to another. Now, sometimes our emotions don't move us at all, do they? Sometimes they can freeze us in place. Um, sometimes they can, they can cause us to stall out. But that's what we're going to talk about today is our emotions and how they create action and sometimes inaction. Um, so, I have a question for you. How much of a person's emotions are apparent to you? How much of a person's emotions are visible to you? A lot? A little? Some people wear their emotions on their sleeve, right? We use that expression sometimes, and what does that mean? That means that they're an open book. You can tell exactly how they're feeling, what they're thinking, what's on their mind, what's troubling them. But then others, a little more sly about it, right? There's not as much to see there. Well, what is this a picture of? It's a picture of an iceberg. Do you know how much of an iceberg is visible above the water? About about a tenth of it. About a tenth of an iceberg is what's generally visible above the water line. And that follows the the buoyancy principles and all of that kind of sciencey stuff that we're not necessarily worried about today. But that means that about 90% of an iceberg remains where? Our emotions are the same way. Okay, even though we may think that we know what someone is thinking and we may be able to identify someone as, a, as an individual that wears their emotions on their sleeve and we think that we can tell what's going on in their life, in reality, what are we really seeing? We're seeing very little of what's going on with the person, right? Yet we respond and react to what we see going on in that person that drives what we think about that person more than anything is just that little snippet so how good of a judge of character are we how good of a judge of what's going on in someone's life the trials and the difficulties or the happiness are we really we're probably not as good as we think we are are we we probably need to extend a little more grace to individuals 
whenever it looks like that they're upset or they're struggling. Because the reality is, we're only seeing what they can't contain, right? There's much more going on inside that is affecting the individual. Now, our emotions are governed by our past and our present experiences and our beliefs, right? A lot of, a lot of what's going on with you and your emotional state, even right now, has to do with what happened when? Yesterday, the day before, last month, years ago. So part of it has to do with what's, going, with what's going on in the moment now, right? Hopefully you are at peace right now. Okay. Hopefully you are feeling uh, some joy right now, but you may not be because you might be overwhelmed by what? Other emotions, right? And you may be struggling to have joy, hope, or peace in this moment. But nonetheless, our, our emotional state is oftentimes governed by what's gone on in our past. So... Based on our experiences, based on our past, we begin to form biases. Everybody know what a bias is? Anybody have any biases? Y'all don't have any biases, right? Room full of people with no biases, correct? No, we all have biases. A bias is a tendency or a preference towards a certain group, an idea, or a concept that influences our judgment and decisions. Okay, so that's what a bias is. These biases are formed around our perception of the world. What we see, what we feel, what we hear, all go into the different biases that we might have. So I want to share a little exercise with you. Um, this was something that they did. I thought this was interesting, and there's a spiritual implication that I kind of want to tie into this that, that Nestor didn't necessarily get into <coughs> in his presentation. So I'll ask you this question. How many squares do you see on the screen? So as you're counting, I heard initially what? 16. Then there was 17. Now I'm getting 22. 21. Do I hear 26? I've got 26 in the back. 28. 28. Anybody? 28. 28. How many do you see? How many? Give me a number. Twenty-six? Okay, we're up to twenty-six. Thirty-two? All right. I'm going to tell you how many squares there are. If you want to know how many squares there are, hang on and listen. There are thirty squares. There's a total of thirty squares up there. Now, notice how we went from 16, which is the initial, those are the, that's the, the 16 that we can see, to immediately 17 because we realize that the one big, the little squares all make up what? One big square. But then where did the other squares start to come from? All the little ones inside. So you have four by four squares, right? You have four little squares that make a bigger square, and that is all the way across, so you would have three squares along the bottom here, Okay. Um, and, and three across the top for six more, and then where's the other squares come from? Then you have the three-by-three three squares. There's four three-by-three three squares that you can have, okay, for a total of 30 squares. Now, what was interesting about this, as he, as he did this, the same thing happened in the room. Everybody started out with, uh, well, there's 16. Oh, wait, yeah, okay, I see it now, and they... They started increasing the number, and we even had people that had found what they thought was more than 30 squares on there. There was somebody, honey, how high did somebody go? Did it get as high as 33 or 36? Okay, all right, I couldn't remember if you were there or not. There was somebody that went, went well over the 30 squares um, that was initially visible. Now, what does this have to do with our spirituality? 
What does this possibly have to do with spiritual conversations and with our spirituality? Well, it has, it has this to do with it. Have you ever had a conversation with somebody about something in the Bible? Raise your hand if you've had a conversation with somebody about something in the Bible. Okay? Raise your hand if you've had a conversation with somebody about something in the Bible, but you didn't have a Bible. Okay? Did the other person have a Bible? No, they didn't have a Bible either. So they were, you, you were both having this conversation, right, about something spiritual, but neither one of you had what? We didn't have the source, right? Now, how many of you have had a conversation, a one-sided conversation with somebody about something in the Bible? You know what I mean by a one-sided conversation? It's where you're talking about things from a spiritual perspective, but the other person, not so much. They're not having a spiritual conversation. They're having more of a... A what? A debate, a debate, maybe a little more of an argument, maybe a more of a cynical point of view. They're not really searching for truth, right? They're just challenging you based on what you have uh, or what your beliefs are. Now, the best conversations that we can have with one another when we have our Bibles is when we all have our Bible open and when we're all looking at the same thing, Right? Because when we all have our Bible open and we're all looking at the same thing, then we can all come to what? The same consensus. We can all come to the same understanding. If I asked you, if I flashed that up on the screen just for a second and then took it down and I said, how many are up there? You guys would have looked at it and you would have formed your own opinion and it would have been at odds with other people, right? Right? But now that we've talked about it, does anybody, does, does anybody feel like there's, there's not 30 squares on the, on the screen there? You may not see them all, but you understand, that, that you understand how we got to being 30 there. When we have conversations, when we have spiritual conversations, we need to make sure that we're all looking at the same thing. And we need to have it out with us. Okay, because that's how you help change hearts and minds. It's not so much what all you know in, in, your, in your own mind and what you can quote scripture, because other people can quote, quote scripture too. But it's when we can sit down and we can reason together. That's what we want to do, right? That's what we should long to do as Christians is to sit down and reason together with people. So our life experiences are filled with emotions, some positive, some negative, but these emotions, one of the things that Nestor said that I found really interesting was that emotions come in families. Now, what do you think that means? What do you think that it means that emotions come in family? So if you're in a good mood right now, how do you feel? Somebody describe to me if you're in a good mood, how do you feel? Okay, happy, content, anything else? You, you feel unusual? <laughs> <clears throat> so these emotions come together as a group, right? If you, if you have joy, you probably also have some other things, right? What would some of those other things be? Happiness, okay. Now, if you don't, if you're scared, if you're upset, you probably also have some other emotions that are coming along with that, right? What would those emotions be? Anxiety, anger, insecurity, okay? So there's a whole family of emotions that comes with the experiences that we're having. It's not just joy by itself. It's not just anxiety by itself, but it drags a bunch of other people along with it. <clears throat> now, in the case of good emotions, that's great. There's nothing wrong with that at all, is there? That's a good thing. But in the case of bad emotions that are bringing other bad emotions and feelings along with it, what does that do to us? It can overwhelm us, right? Right? You can become overwhelmed. You can feel like you can lose hope for one thing. 
You can feel like you have lost hope. So emotions work in families. Now, there's some Bible verses that I want to share with you. You're welcome to look at these if you want. I'm going to, I'm going to read through them. I've got them on here. I'm going to read through them as we, uh, as we talk about them here. Isaiah 41.10 Look at these emotions that are talked about in the Bible, okay? Isaiah 41.10. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not, be an- do not anxiously look about, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. What are the emotions that you saw there? Fear and anxiety, right? Talks about not being fearful and not to be anxious. John 14, 27. John 14, 27 says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. What emotions did you hear there? Peace, and not to become fearful. Don't be afraid. Okay? 1 Peter 5, verses 6 and 7. 1 Peter 5, verses 6 and 7. Therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. What emotion? Anxiety. And Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7. Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7 says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything be prayer, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God which surpasses all comprehension will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Anxiety again, right? Peace again. So as we've looked at these different verses, we have anxiety, we have peace, we have being strengthened. We have fearful, we have humility that's been mentioned. These are all emotions that the Bible talks about. Now, why do you think the Bible talks about these things? Is it because they're not applicable to you and me? Because he knew that we were anxious beings. Because he knew that we were fearful beings. Because he knew that we needed his peace in our lives right? So he shares these things with us. Now let me ask you a question. As we've talked about some of these emotions, and we've looked at some biblical examples of some of these emotions, I'm going to ask you a question. Are the decisions that you make in life affected by your emotions? Are the decisions that you make in your life affected by your emotions? Yes, they most certainly are. You can be the, you can be the most, most uh, stoic person in the world, okay, and think that you've got it all under control and the most rational being that there is. But in reality, somewhere deep down inside, there is a, a little boy or a little girl that is anxious, that is nervous, that is scared, that's wondering, that needs a little help, that needs a little encouragement, that would like for somebody to pat them on the back and say, good job, right? That exists. It may be buried deep down inside, but that person exists somewhere in each one of us. And that person has a lot to do with how we respond to the, to the difficulties and to the world around us. So let me ask you a question. With what attitude do you approach decisions? Do you... If you're in a negative mood, is it a good time to make a decision? Probably not so much, right? So what do you want to do? You want to wait until you're you're in a better frame of mind. Have you ever said, I need to wait a minute and make this decision later? Now's not the time for me to make this decision because I'm an emotional basket case. Things have just gone on in my life and I don't have it together right now, so I need to wait and decide on this important life-changing thing later. Anybody ever had that conversation with themselves? Yeah. 
let's talk about the two ways we view decisions that we have to make. What do you think about this statement? What do you think about this statement? Say it. Say it out loud. How does that make you feel? You don't like it, do you? Is it because you don't like to be told what to do? Maybe. Is it because it makes you feel like you don't have control? Maybe. What are some other things that that makes you feel? Huh? Anxious? Anxious? Okay. All right, because it, it, it's putting a it's putting a, a roadblock in into in your way, right? I have to means that it's something that that I had other plans, I had other ideas, I had other thoughts, but now those have been interrupted, and I have to. Okay, all right, interesting, interesting. What about this one? How does this one make you feel? Everybody, say this one out loud. Which one do you feel better saying? You feel better saying, I choose to. Why? Because you have a choice. Because you've been able to make a choice. Because you feel like you're not being forced to do something that you don't want to do. Now, what does this have to do with our emotions? Well, the question is, how often, how often in life are you faced with I have to decisions versus I choose to decisions. So here's the question for you. Can you change your mindset? Can you choose to make those I have to decisions to become I choose to decisions? Sometimes you can. If you work at it, yes, you can. You can make the conscious decision to say, you know what? I would normally say I have to do this, but today I'm going to say I choose to do it. And I'm going to set myself free. I'm going to cut myself free of this burden of I have to. And I'm going to say I choose to. How many of you have to go to work Monday morning? How many of you choose to go to work Monday morning? Okay. So, so there's, some, there's, some, there's some real ways to apply this in our lives. And if you'll stand back and take a moment to say, you know what? I don't want to have to do this. I want to choose to do it. You'll be surprised at the difference that it will make in your life. You'll be surprised at the amount of effort that you're willing to put into something that you choose to do over something that you have to do. How much effort do you put into things you have to do? The bare minimum, right? The bare minimum. How much effort do you put into things that you choose to do? A lot more. A lot more. When it comes to church, here's a difficult question for you. You knew it was coming. Here's a difficult question for you. When you got up to come to church this morning, did anybody say to themselves, I have to go to church today? I hope none of you, but my money would be on somebody probably felt like they had to come to church today. My hope is that you will begin to feel like I choose to come to church. Sometimes you may have, you may have had that feeling, I have to go to church today because there is a responsibility awaiting you at church, right? You're a Sabbath school teacher. You're a song leader. You're, you're, a, a, uh, you're the AV team guys that have to get here early to do all kinds of stuff. Do you have to be here or do you choose to be here? My hope is that you choose to be here. My hope is that you can change your mindset and do away with the I have to's and begin to choose to be here to be a part of things that are going on. Let's talk about the simplest emotion and the spiritual implications that it has for a moment. The simplest emotion that you can show to somebody is what? Thankfulness. Think about it. What did you say whenever Rodney opened the doors for you out there this morning? 
<laughs> Eddie, I don't think that's what you said. <clears throat> I really don't, but I appreciate it. You said thank you. When your server brings you a glass of water, what do you say? Do you have to say that? No, but why'd you say it? Just to be, to be polite, to be courteous, right? Because you appreciated what that person did for you. Even though it was something small, and in the grand scheme of things, it was pretty meaningless, right? The fact that you got your cup of water, in the grand scheme of things, was pretty meaningless, right? Look, here, real world example. What am I fixing to say? Thank you. You're <laughs> <clears throat> Thankfulness is one of the most simplest things, one of the most simplest ex emotions that we can express to people. Turn to Romans chapter 1. This is a powerful, a powerful verse here, a couple of verses that I want to share with you. Romans chapter 1, verses 21 through 23. 21 through 23. Now Paul here is talking to the Romans about how the world had become unrighteous and about how humanity had lost sight of God. And as he's talking about this, he, he describes some things here in verses 21 through 23. He says, Because although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God, or nor, nor were they what? Thankful but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Now, what is Paul describing here? He's describing idols, right? He's descri And what is an idol? It's something that replaces God, right? And it becomes God to us. And they had, taken, they had taken the concept of God as the creator, and they had done away with it. They didn't, they didn't want God anymore, and instead they began to explain God through other things. And they set up God's creation as God itself. Okay, they, had, they took these idols, they took these graven images, whatever they would be, maybe, maybe a bird, maybe whatever it was that they could fashion and, and shape out of stone or out of wood or whatever it was out of, these became their gods to them. They took the creation and created a god from it instead of letting the creation point to the creator. And as Paul's describing this here to the Romans, he's, telling, he's talking to the Romans about how, they've, how this has wound up coming to this point. And one of the key things that he, that, he, that he picks up on in verse 21, that they knew God. In other words, they, you, you can't look around the world, around creation, and not see God. You can choose to ignore creation and say, that's not God. But you can't look around at creation and not acknowledge that there is a living God. But yet they had done that, and it says that they also weren't thankful. What's one of the most simple things that we can do when we get up in the morning? What do you do? Do you thank, do you thank God for the life that you have? Do you have prayer and say, Lord, thank you for the good night's rest. Thank you for this opportunity that is before me today. Thank you that I have the opportunity to witness to others. Put words in my mouth for you. Do you do that? Or do you get up and you go on about your way, not giving any thought or any consideration for the good things that God has done for you or wants to do for you? Now, here's a one-stop shop for your emotions. We talked about how emotions work in families, right? They, they dra drag a whole group of people with them. 
They've got, they've got, you've got fear and anxiety and, and uh, insecurity. And it, when, when one of them comes, the whole group wants to come and hang out at your house. Okay? They don't just like to come by themselves. They like to bring their buddies with them. And it's the same way with good emotions. Okay? You invite a good emotion in, and guess what? There's three or four pals that come along with that good emotion. They want to be there too. So your one-stop shop. Invite an, a positive, inviting a positive emotion in will cause all the others to get up and leave. They can't stand to be in the same room together. Fear and anxiety can't hang out where there's hope. Anger, disappointment, and frustration can't exist where love is hanging around. They drive each other away. They are polar opposites. If you think about the magnet, you know, right? You've, you've had a couple of magnets. There's one way that they'll clap together and they're, and they're locked in. And there's another way that they're, they're polar opposites. They will not come together, right? That's the way positive and negative emotions are. They cannot stand to be together and they won't be brought together. Think about it this way. Where there's hope, there is life. Another thing that occurs in our lives that can affect our emotions is change. Who likes change? Oh, <laughs> I saw some of you like start shaking your head quite, quite furiously. I don't like change. I don't want change. Please don't make anything change. Change is unfortunately a necessary part of life, isn't it? We experience change every day, every week, every year. Some change is good, right? Sometimes there's good changes, and then there's the not-so-good changes. <clears throat> so let's talk about change for just a minute. Stages of change that I choose. Have you ever chosen to do something different in your life? You say to yourself, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start having devotions every morning, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a change. Or... <clears throat> whatever the case may be, you decide for yourself <coughs> excuse me, that you want to implement a change in your life. <clears throat> so these are, the, cha- these are the, the stages that you go through whenever you experience change. The first one, pre-contemplation. This is the idea that, okay... <clears throat> Someone has suggested that maybe you could do this or maybe you could do that. And you're evaluating it. You're like, ah, yeah, maybe I could. I guess I could, you know, get up and start having devotions in the morning. Maybe that's something I'll do. I'll consider that. Okay, that's the pre-contemplation phase. <clears throat> then you have the contemplation phase where you begin to realize that, you know what, this is something that I want in my life. This is something that I want to do. And I'm, now you're starting to seriously think about how you're going to do it. Okay, so you start thinking, okay, you know what, I normally have to get up at 6 to get ready for work, so I'm going to start getting up at 5.30, and that's going to give me 30 minutes. I can do it that way, or maybe I could do it this way, but that's the contemplation phase, okay? And then is the preparation phase. You start to make plans for it. This is how we're actually going to put it into action. Now, you may, not, you may be thinking to yourself, I don't go through all of those steps whenever I'm making changes in my life. Yeah, you, you probably do. You just haven't broken it down and realized how much you're actually looking at things. Okay? Then there's the preparation phase. That's where you're getting everything together. You set the alarm for the next morning. Things are ready to go. You've got your Bible verses picked out, what you're going to study, and you're ready to go. And that leads you to action. What is the action phase? That's where you've actually done it. Everything that you've done before that leads up to that action phase and how successful you're going to be, okay? After the action phase is the maintenance phase. What's the maintenance phase? Okay, doing it over again, tweaking it so that it's easier or better whenever you do it, right? Now, <clears throat> the difficult thing is with change, there's one, there's one step that I've left off here. There's one critical step that I've left off. What do you think it is? It's something that we've all experienced, some of us in, in with some of us with more dire consequences than others. What do you think it is? 
No, it's not failure, but it's related to failure. Relapse. What is relapse? Relapse is I was, I was in the doing it phase and I was in the maintenance phase and things were happening, but then I stopped doing it. Now, the interesting thing about relapse is, and as Nestor was talking about this, he was sharing with us how, how some, with, to some degree, how this works with, with addicts and how when they struggle with, with some of these changes that they're, that they're making in their life, if the change is foundational, okay, meaning if the change is, is wanted and rooted in something deep inside of the person, even if they are dealing with addiction and with things like that, when they relapse, it doesn't throw them back to step number one. It moves them back to step number four, back to the action phase. Okay, you relapse, you go back to the action phase because it's change that you want. It's change that you're looking for in your life. Okay, it moves you back to action where you begin making decisions again. Okay, that didn't work. We're going to try this and this and this and this is the way we're going to do it and let's go. Okay, relapse is a natural part of decision making and changing in your life. How many of you have have experienced relapse in your life with decisions that you've made? More than likely, all of you have. You've made a decision. I'm going to start doing this. (coughs) Excuse me. And you do it for a little while, and what happens? Eh, You kind of stop doing it, right? And you kind of of like, eh, well, I need to get... And you say to yourself, I need to get back to doing that. You've experienced relapse. Okay. We don't often think about it like this, but there is a journey most of us go through when attempting to make changes in our life. And understanding these stages can help us be more successful at implementing change. Relapse is often viewed as a negative or in negative light and associated with a host of negative emotions, but it doesn't have to be. Relapse is something that we all experience when implementing change. New habits need supporting habits. New habits need supporting habits. Okay? Positive reinforcement. On the flip side of this change is change that we don't want. What does change that we don't want look like? Change that we don't choose... Looks a lot like what? Looks a lot like grief. I wonder why. It's because it's not what we wanted. It follows the same, some of the same stages as grief. Only there's one that's missing. There's one that we're going to add to this that should be added also to the grief cycle. But you go through denial, anger, bargaining, sadness, and eventually acceptance with change that you don't choose. Somebody give me an example of change that you didn't choose for yourself. Okay, getting older. All right, that's that's one that we don't have much control over, right? What else? Anybody else? A health crisis? Okay, And, and I heard somebody over here. Did somebody say something? No? Okay. All right. So change that I don't choose, but there's one important thing missing here from change. <clears throat> there's one important component missing from change that we don't choose, and that is this. Purpose. Do we allow changes that come to our life that we don't choose to become a new purpose, to create new purpose in our lives? We go through these stages of denial, anger, bargaining, sadness, and eventually accepting the change that we've been faced with. It is now we have the opportunity to allow that change that we didn't want to represent new purpose in our lives. Have you ever looked at it that way? Have you ever thought about it like that? It's a new opportunity. It's a new purpose. It's something new 
that it's something new that you get to experience. The healthy outcome of change we don't want in our lives would be for us to come to a new sense of purpose. Something new that drives us, engages us, something new to live for. Ultimately, we shouldn't process negative emotions by ourselves. When we experience change that we don't choose, one of the worst things that we can do is to deal with it by ourselves. Why do you think that is? Have you ever taken a magnifying glass out in the sun and put it on an anthill? What happens? You burn the ants up, right? Because that magnifying glass is laser focusing what? It's laser focusing the sun down on this one point. Have you ever experienced change that you didn't want in your life and you put a microscope over it, you put a magnifying glass over it, and you began looking at it, and that was all that you focused on? And you began, you just, you just focused intently on that. What does that do to you? It wears you out. Exactly. You become, you become self-absorbed in everything that's going on. You begin processing a bunch of negative emotions because all you're looking at is something that, that you didn't want. Something that you didn't choose that's occurring in your life and you're hyper aware of it and you're focused in, laser focused on it with this magnifying glass. Is anything good going to come of that? More than likely not. We shouldn't process negative emotions by ourselves. This is one of the reasons why church is such a good thing. This is one of the reasons why we need each other is to process negative emotions. The things that we don't choose that happen in our lives, we have a group of people who can embrace us, who can lift us up, who can encourage us, who can help us to take the magnifying glass off of ourselves and look for what? Look for new purpose. All right. So that brings us to past, present, and future. So as we talk about our emotions, and we talk about what we do with our emotions, have you ever known somebody who drug around bad emotional experiences all their life? And they took them wherever they went, right? What do you think that does to the person? Do, do, do they wake up in the morning refreshed and ready to go and tackle the world and excited? Or do they have the weight of the world pressing in on them? Kids get off my lawn. <laughs> Kids get off my lawn. I want to invite somebody to come up here for a moment. Who would like to? I, I need somebody a little uh, bigger than me, preferably. Somebody want to come up and join me for a minute? All right, Mike. Appreciate it. You are, you are bigger than me, yes. Yes, sir. Okay. So, Mike, I am going to, I am your, I'm going to represent your emotions, okay? And, and you are representing Mike. So we're going to join hands, okay? And right now, you, I, I am positive emotions in Mike's life, right? Am I creating a burden for you? Am, am, am I actually, could I actually be helpful at some point where we're at? Okay. So now, let's think about these negative emotions for a minute. What do negative emotions do to us? How do you feel now, Mike? Are you having to put a little work into holding on to these emotions? Okay. Well, now, what happens if I begin to put a little more effort into dragging you down? Is it, how about, how about, uh, okay. Do you get the point? What do our emotions, thank you, Mike, appreciate it. What do our emotions do to us? They weigh us down. Our negative emotions can weigh us down, okay? And we drag them around with us, but what happens when we let go of them? Peace, freedom. So look at some of these past emotions. And think to yourselves, am I harboring any of these? Am I holding on to any of these things? To anger, anxiousness, sadness, regret, remorse, unsettled, 
powerless, victimized? Are you holding on to any of those things from your past? They're things that happened years ago, aren't they? Is there anything that you can do about them in the present? They're things that have already happened, right? But yet, we, hold, we want to hold on to them. If we would let them go, in the present, we have the energy to act. Okay? Today, you have the present, you have the opportunity to let go. And to say, I'm not going to hold on to these things anymore. I'm not going to let them take, I'm not going to let them have control. I'm not going to let them drain power from me. Okay? Because they do put a strain on your life. But I want to let them go. So that your future can look like what? Peaceful, relieved, lighter, relaxed, hopeful, forgiven, and empowered. Sometimes our emotions become overrun with trying to be everything to everybody. I've got to be dad. I've got to be lieutenant. I've got to be pastor. I've got to be son. I've got to be a friend. You ever felt like that before? Like, I've got to be everything to everybody? Here's four, here's four S's that I want to share with you. This is from Roger Hernandez, ministerial director for the Southern Union. He shared these, these four steps to relieving some of that feeling of being everything to everybody at every moment. Start, schedule, send, and stop. Four simple things. Start. These are things that have to be done right now. You've got to do them. You recognize it. They've got to, they've got to be done. You start them. Schedule. These are things that can wait. Recognize what can wait in your life. Give it some time and schedule it. Okay? Send. This is delegation. Can somebody else do this for you? Are you able to let someone else handle this for you? If you can, let them handle it. And then stop. And I love the stop the most. I love the stop the most because this is, this is, this is especially true to me. We, <clears throat> I, have a, I have a bad habit of trying to fix everything. Um, if, if, if something's broken, if something needs to be repaired, if there's an issue, uh, I want to find a solution for it. That's, that's a part of who I am. I'm, a, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a, a Mr. Mr. Fix-It, Mr. Get in the middle of it, even whenever I probably don't need to. One of the things that he said with concerning stop was recognize the things that you're good at and do them. Recognize the things that you're okay at and help out. Recognize the things that you're not so good with and let them go. Don't try to do them. Don't try to get in the middle of them. Let somebody else do them. It's okay. And I found that very, I found that for me, that was peaceful. I appreciated that. I had intended to show a video. Y'all didn't, y'all didn't get the video up, did you? Okay. I had intended to show a video. I'll ask you this question, though. How many of you remember I Love Lucy? Okay, most of you, most of you remember I Love Lucy. How many of you remember the episode in the Chocolate Factory? Okay, most, most of you remember the episode in the Chocolate Factory where, where Lucy and um, Et, Ethel were, were sitting and they had a conveyor belt of little, of little chocolates that was coming by them, right? And they were supposed to wrap them and put them back on the conveyor belt. Well, it started out meaningful, uh, it started out innocently enough, right? The conveyor belt's going along, and they're like, oh, this is easy, I got this, yep, no problem, nope. And then what happened? The conveyor started to get faster. And as it's getting faster, they're starting to rake them off of the conveyor belt, because if they don't get them all, they're going to get fired. <coughs> and Lucy and Ethel, they're putting them in their mouth, and they're shoving them in their apron, and they're doing, they're putting them everywhere that they can as they're trying to wrap them but they have to get them off the conveyor belt. I want you to think about this. 
This final spiritual implication. When Satan can't stop you, he will accelerate you. When Satan can't stop you, he will accelerate you. He will get you going so fast and so hard that you can't keep up. He won't try to stop you. He'll just work you to death. Are you tired? I want to share this with you. What, is this, what, is, what verse does this remind you of? Are you tired, burned down on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. What verse does that sound like to you? Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Those that are weary and heavy laden, is he talking about people that have been working out in the field all day? Or is he talking about people that are emotionally drained? Emotionally worn out. Can't keep up with life anymore. It's the latter. It's the latter. Are you tired and burned out? Come to Jesus. Jesus, are you familiar with a yoke? What a yoke is? You ever, everybody played Oregon Trail at some point in time and had a yoke of oxen, right? Okay, it's side by side. It's a, it's a, it's, it goes over their necks and it allows them to do what together? To pull together, to work together. Now, if one of the oxen isn't, isn't able to pull at the moment, what does the yoke allow to happen? The other one can pull while the one is resting. Doesn't mean that they're both fighting against that yoke and pulling but it means that they're both bound together. Notice that Jesus says, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus wants us to yoke up with him and let him do some of the pulling. Let him do some of the work. Allow us to rest to recuperate, to become focused, to learn from Him. Friends, our emotions have a lot to do with who we are and with what goes on in our lives. And as we shared last week, one in five Americans deal with some sort of, a, of mental health issue in their lives. As we talked about last week, our young people, our kids, face a level of anxiety today that in the 70s you would have been clinically treated for. If you need help, there is a resource here that I would like to share with you. It's called PsySun. It's Psychologists and Son of God put together. It is, it is, it is intended to be Christian counselors that want to, want to help. It's all online. The, the cost for it is uh, each, each provider sets their own cost level. It doesn't get you locked into having to meet every week or every whatever the case may be. Like sometimes if you've tried to seek out help like this, people sometimes they want to get you locked into a, an 8 or a 12 week program and you have to meet regularly and, and this sort of thing. This is an opportunity for you to have a little more control over seeking some help. If you would like to, to be able to access that website, there's a QR code there that you can scan um, to be able to, uh, to access that. But it's sisun.org. 
and uh, it provides an affordable and flexible resource for those that might, might need a little help getting through life. That's what it's there for. Friends, I appreciate everything that each one of you do. And I want you to know that you're not in life by yourself. We're in it together as a group. We love each other. We draw close to each other. And we lift up one another when we're struggling. We don't cast each other down, but we build each other up. Will you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, Thank you, Lord, for this time together. Father, as we have talked about our emotions, as we've talked about life in general today, I pray, Lord, that you would yoke up with each one of us, that our burdens would be made lighter. If we're experiencing a dark time in our lives, Lord, I pray that you would shine a light. Shine light where there's darkness. Provide peace and hope where there seems like there's only insanity. Lord, thank you for loving us, for guiding us, for calling us your children. Father, I pray that as we go our separate ways, that we would be lights to others, Lord. That you would give us words to speak of encouragement, of healing. That we might lift somebody up to you. In Jesus' name we pray.